Hey, Catherine, thanks so much for coming back on the Simplifying Entrepreneurship podcast. We're going to talk a little bit about sales today again, and it's just great to have you back. Thank you so much for having me back. I'm delighted to be here. You know, one of the things that we just talked about a while ago, and it's like, oh, we have to do a podcast on this, is is the idea that you came up with an assessment and went through what you called the respectability scale. And we need to hear a little bit more about the respectability scale and how that all works in the in with regards to salespeople, Catherine. Okay, great. Thank you. So I have noticed for 20 plus years, my whole sales career, I've had a couple different kinds of sales consulting firms. And over the years of having dozens and dozens of clients, I've noticed that people in various sales roles hold back. They seem to be worried about being perceived as too pushy. They have what some people call call reluctance. You see all these different ways that negative feelings about sales come up in people's behavior. For sure. And so one of the theories I wanted to test was, and one of the reasons that I named my book, How Good Humans Sell, is because I believe that this is this is juxtaposing this issue. Can you really be a good person, a respectable, likable, honest human, and be wildly successful in selling? Or will selling compromise something in you and require something of you that will disqualify you from being considered a good human? Right. So to test that, I have done a lot of anonymous surveying. I made sure that people were professional full-time sales employees when they filled out the survey. So we, you know, threw out people that were part-time or, or even the owners of a business who are the sellers. We wanted them to be sales employees just for the purpose of this, of this survey. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is we, I named seven professions. I was testing this idea of respectability and what people think about the respectability of their own profession in sales. Mm -hmm. And I purposely picked a combination of blue collar and um, white collar professions. I even threw in a little bit of religion just to see. I actually thought that would get lower respectability just because it was such a wide sampling of people. And so I had religious leader slash pastor as one of the choices. And Mm -hmm. how it worked, Pete, is you weren't ranking all of them against each other saying this is most respectable, you know, lawyers, most respectable and pastors least respectable. You weren't doing it that way. You were independently rating on a scale of one to 10, one being the least respectable kind of job you can imagine. And 10 being the most respectable kind of job you can imagine. You were independently reviewing each of the job titles. And what happened that was just so heartbreaking was that the sales professionals themselves ranked sales last. It got a a 6.4 out of a possible scale of 10 and everything else was ranked above it. And they're working in sales. They're salespeople. That's their job. Amazing. That was that was amazing to me when you mentioned that. Really, it's so sad. It's so it sad. is. So it they is. would rather be IT professionals. They'd rather be doctors. They'd rather be religious leaders. They'd rather be plumbers. I mean, those were all other choices that were given to them. Wow. Or maybe maybe that's not the right way to say it. Maybe it's not that they would rather be. They just said that was a more respectable profession. So what I'm wondering then, and what I was seeking to do after that, is say, okay, if this is the case, if overall we have an average of six point four. On, on the respectability scale, yeah. what do we do from here? Does that affect our actions? And yes, it does affect our actions, but that's what well, yeah. I wanted to do. It, it, it's got to affect the mindset, right? The mindset of the of those people. And, and what are you kind of, how are you saying, okay, here's what we've got now, and how do we move them ahead? What I have come to believe from my research is that actually you can't build a team. If you have several people, you're going to have a wide variety of what people think, no matter how hard you try to screen out for this. This is because the the feelings are not all overt. Some are covert, meaning some are hidden even to Mm themselves. So first we have to know that that's true. So for entrepreneurs, for business owners, I would say it's true. It's just true. And acting like it's not true doesn't serve us. So first we know it's true. Second, we we talk about it openly and we encourage our staff to, to begin to notice what they say to themselves 
So that could be in the form of, you know, just in their mind, like self-talk, self-suggestion. Yeah. It could be reflected in things they say. Let me give you an example. When a person says, I'm just trying to follow up, that has an implication, potentially, that they think they're bothering someone. The just word. There's lots of words like that. So we want to notice what we say. We want to create a culture where people can reflect, hey, Pete, I heard you say this. Mm -hmm. Because these are also nervous fillers, so we don't always know when we're doing those things. Right. We train ourselves to listen to ourselves. We know what's going on between our ears. Nobody else knows. We start practicing paying attention. We notice what our coworkers are saying. We watch what kind of culture we're building. We're honest about this issue. And then there are other ways that you can go about reframing sales and building a different culture and, and even building different individual beliefs about what's possible and what purpose sales can serve inside a business. But you have to be very deliberate about the way you manage a team, what you encourage them to do themselves to build up these beliefs. There's steps you can take for that. By the way, tell us a little bit about your book that was recently released. Thank Before you. We do. Yeah. Thank you. So the book is called How Good Humans Sell. It's a combination of some of the things we're talking about here with some original research, yeah. how social science applies to selling. So we talk about, I talk about phenomenons like how does cognitive dissonance show up in selling? How does imposter syndrome show up in selling? A helpful effect we talk about is the spotlight effect, like part of why people shrink back and don't pursue and follow up on leads as much as they should is because they actually mistakenly think the spotlight is on them and they think people are paying attention when they're not. So I look for where I can apply those principles that are coming out in social science and behavioral economics and then tie them to, to sales and say, this is still true here. Notice where these things are true. And then I protect the innocent. All the names are changed, but all of the examples of do this, don't do this are true stories of real life business to business clients I've served where we talk about times we were rewarded for being more persistent, common beliefs we want to notice that I was able to coach someone through. And so there's some live, live examples too. That's awesome. You know, uh, they're stories, right? And we're both sort of affiliated with on the story brand side of things with Business Made Simple and, and you're a story brand certified coach as well. And, mm -hmm. you know, those stories make make the, the book that much better, too. Right. Mm -hmm. it's a, right. It's a, in fact, the last chapter of the book in Chapter eight, it's, it's not very long. It's 110 pages, not a long paperback. But in Chapter eight, I talk about this hero's journey metaphor that is so popular mm -hmm. among the Business Made Simple and Story Brand community. The idea is that everybody's on journey. We're mm -hmm. all the hero of our own story. When we make ourselves be the hero of someone else's story, and we talk about ourselves all the time in yeah. sales, then we're inverting the order and we're disturbing the order because what's tricky, Pete, is Hollywood teaches us to identify with the hero. So we actually think in sales that when we think about story, we think, oh, I have to tell stories about my other clients or I have to tell you the story of how my grandfather started the company 40 years ago. But that's not what we mean. We mean... No they are the author of their own story. And then in sales, we come along as a guide recognizing, I have an opportunity to meet you just at this right moment in time, potentially, yeah. and help you with whatever is next in that journey. And when I see myself in that role, I should have more confidence since in movies and literature, the guide is the one that actually is the stronger character. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, I think some, some of the stuff you wrote, the idea that they're looking for status and security and comfort, right? And you're there to guide them through that. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tackle yes, that exactly. a little bit? So I, I, I put status, security, and comfort in, I, I talk about those as what I call the MVP list, mm -hmm. that every question a person asks themselves about their own motives for buying or their own values, they're measuring up and saying, is this going to get me where I'm trying to go? Any possible internal question, I mean, internal, like in the head and heart, the person is considering while making a purchase. How much do I value this? How much do I want it? Will this make me look good? Is this a threat to me? Will this help me get promoted? Will this make me get demoted? All those questions can be characterized into those three bubbles. So picture these three circles that have this you know, middle point that's comfort, security, and status. Everything a person worries about falls in those three categories. That's so awesome. whether I'm yeah. selling shoes or I'm yeah. selling software or I'm selling sales training services, I'm evaluating 
the quality of the thing before me. So it is truly, I don't want to have a broken pair of shoes or bad sales training, but mm -hmm. I'm also simultaneously evaluating comfort, status, security. And when a salesperson understands that, then they ask questions that get the prospect to begin to share things. They may not divulge all of it, but they could right. give you hints. They could, they could give you information that help you realize I can really help this person. And you have this moment where you see opportunities to be a guide. And that's where you start really feeling good about your job, right? That when we kind of started off saying that, you know, all of the respectability was low. It's like you start really feeling that power that you're contributing and you're doing really well. You know, one of the things we like to do on the podcast is is uh, gives people a few actionable steps. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how can you be a good human and sell a lot more than you are right now? What are the, what would be a couple of good steps for salespeople and for business leaders that are listening? Because business leaders are selling every day, too. They're selling mm -hmm. internally to themselves, like in, to their own teams and all that sort of stuff. They have to sell their vision and they also are selling externally as well so what would a couple of action steps be uh, as sort of a final takeaway here for, for sure day? so I think of two Pete one is mm. there are four ways that an individual can build beliefs that and literally change what they think about something so many of us um, in you know coaching circles and things like that will talk about attitudes about money mm -hmm. right or attitudes about success or what i think is possible for myself as a person well anything we want to change about ourselves, there are these four steps you go through that have to do with you practice visualization you want to have clear goal setting there are these different steps the step and answer i would give and this would be about really for managers and people mm -hmm. who oversee a sales team is that i wish that one of the things we would do is have some incentive and some performance metrics around referrals and qualifying and disqualifying sooner and just doing the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> so what I mean by that is the bigger a sales team gets, when you start to have someone oversee that sales team and be a sales director or sales manager, what they do is they're, they're, they're really obsessed about opportunities in the pipeline and days to closure and, and forecasts. And we yep. understand why, because we have numbers to make and we have budgets to hit and things sure. like that. But what happens is a lot of times there are actually incentives to not do the right thing and not really be a good human. Because sometimes being a good human is realizing earlier, I need to give this person an out and stop standing in the meeting and acting like this deal is going forward when it's really not going to go forward. Yeah. But we don't have we don't have the we don't have that culture and we don't have a place where we truly reward and commend people or have strategic relationships where if someone's on a fit for me, maybe there's a place I can send them that is still beneficial to us. It's not accepted, right? It ha or it hasn't been accepted, you know, for a long time to allow that sort of thing to happen and to and to honor it basically for the client, right? But and, then I and, think what that does is because people already are worried about respectability, as we talked about in the beginning, mm -hmm. That reinforces the idea that really what I have to do is I have to push, even if it's not the right thing for you. And that goes against the guide metaphor where the guide is saying, look, I can help you. I've got skills, but I mean, I'm not going to make you come along with no. me. Right. I'm going to offer. For and sure. so when we that's where we get to cognitive dissonance, when we have key performance indicators and metrics and reward systems that are not actually rewarding high sales and other elements of just being a good human being. And I think that's a really good takeaway here, Catherine, because most of the people that listen to this podcast are, are the leaders and the entrepreneurs themselves in the business. And that's what they need to do in order to, to allow that to happen for their salespeople too, right? They've got to, that's they've got right. to set and, that and up. And I understand. I mean, sales sales makes people's dreams. I mean, you need lots yeah, of sales to have businesses sure. flourish and businesses flourish, then everybody flourishes. Mm -hmm. But I do think that as leaders, we have a responsibility to also be playing the long game and realize that when we do the right thing for that pers prospective client or this pers prospective customer in that moment, we will have a lifelong relationship with them. You want to be long term minded and train people to be that way, because when you're a 27 year old sales rep, you haven't lived very long, and so hmm. you don't think like that naturally because you haven't had that many relationships that have been that long. But when you're a 47-year-old relationship and you realize you've sold to the same individual three times for three different companies, 
because they follow you around because they like you and you've treated you them well see it work mm-hmm. right you see that you see that principle at play so making that making the right thing doing the right thing in this moment and having that be part of the culture that helps being a great salesperson and being a good human go together and that's what really reduces cognitive dissonance and that's what everybody who's selling really wants that's the way they want to feel yeah i love that and i think that's a great spot to end our little episode here today thanks so much for being a part of it again here, Catherine. I love to have you and hopefully you'll come back again and we'll talk another episode sometime down the road on some sales uh, and all the structures around that. I just love Mm -hmm. having you as part of this. Um, We heard a little bit about your book, but why don't you tell everybody how they can get a copy of the book or how they can get in touch with you if they want a little bit more information. Everything about me can be found at my website, which is called extraboldsales.com, E-X-T-R-A-B-O-L-D, sales.com. And so that there's a link to the book, which you can also purchase on Amazon, probably on all the social platforms I'm most active on LinkedIn. I can also be found there. Awesome. That's great. Well, thanks again and really appreciate your time here today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye for now.